I'm Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick. And I'm Dr. David Malbranch. How are you, David? I'm good, Lisa. How are you doing today? Good. I, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the Southern HIV epidemic. You know, we've been at this a long time, and sometimes it feels like we're running in place. And I know you're working in the South right now. So tell me a little bit about what you're seeing with respect to the epidemic in the South. Well, I think, you know, it's a good question. I think we've been seeing for a number of years now, if not decades, especially the new cases of HIV uh, being solely planted in the South. And whereas, you know, 40 years ago at the beginning of the epidemic, it was on each of the coasts, say New York City, uh, California. Uh, now what we're seeing is that it's planted firmly in the Southeast. And I think, you know, when we talk about the South, we have to kind of be clear about a lot of the dynamics uh, that are going on in the South. Um, with regards to you know, the history of slavery, uh, Jim Crow, what's been going on with redlining and some of the other structural and social contextual factors that have really driven that and the health inequity with HIV among black and brown people. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said about kind of the conservatism of the, uh, of the Southern region, how we talk about sex, uh, how we shame and stigmatize sex, how we do risk reduction and harm reduction and what we think about that um, and kind of some of the less progressive things that are happening in the South that uh, perhaps has been embraced a little bit more widely by the, by the West Coast, by the East Coast, New York, D.C. in particular, um, and has helped to mitigate uh, some of the new infections. But I think where we see in the South is kind of a, a cultural milieu that provides for almost like a, a metaphorical Petri dish where HIV can be allowed to thrive. A metaphorical Petri dish. I love that. <laughs> you know, I, I think if you layer on top of that, the lack of Medicaid expansion and the treatment access gaps, uh, you have a perfect storm for an HIV epidemic that is thriving. And I think it's a bit disgraceful at this time uh, in the epidemic. We are not making, we're not making strides in the area where people are most disproportionately affected by uh, HIV. What do you think it's going to take for us to move the needle, particularly on uh, treatment access in the South? Well, I think with treatment access, it has a lot to do with both people getting access. I think the Medicaid expansion is a huge thing. And that's where it kind of ties back. When you think about the South, you can't really extract uh, the H, the current HIV epidemic, and even what we're seeing with the pandemic and COVID-19, you can't neatly extract that from the politics of the region. So, um, you know, as we're recording this, we're in the middle of this runoff election in Georgia. So I think you have to think about what the ideals are. Uh, and when we talk about health equity and creating the structures and the systems, um, instead of just talking about racial disparities and health disparities, when we're just talking about the numbers themselves, really switching that conversation and talking more about health equity um, and how to achieve that by creating systems or maintaining systems that will allow people from different backgrounds, whether they be socioeconomic or racial or sexual orientation or gender identity, to be able to achieve that. So I think you know things like Medicaid expansion is going to help, but I also think a restructuring and a revisioning, a revamping of our medical systems is absolutely imperative. And, you know, the one silver lining I can think about with COVID-19 is that it has forced us to change some things and it has exposed some of the inadequacies and the issues with our uh, medical systems uh, acutely as we've had to respond to this pandemic as it's evolved that will actually, if we listen and if we pay attention and if we know what's going on, will help us to improve the systems and help provider patient relations, the nature of the systems and what we make people go through, especially if they don't have insurance and they're living with HIV and the way we deliver care, whether it be virtually, whether we do home visits, whether we do traditional brick and mortar. I think there's a lot that we can learn and, and glean from this pandemic. Um, and I'm hopeful that you know, if the, the politics kind of goes in the right direction where people are going to be more progressive and more focused about health equity than simply maintenance of power, then we can get into issues of Medicaid expansion. We can get into funding resources and prioritizing HIV 
and then hopefully it'll it'll provide the infrastructure and the foundation on which we can provide better access to care. Yeah, but in the, in the absence of shifting politics, which I think is a tall order uh, in the South, we have to look at other ways to influence these changes you're talking about in the healthcare system. So for instance, how can we uh, increase the, the advocacy coming from churches and community-based organizations, or even educating the community about the need to advocate uh, for a better health care for themselves. I think, I, I don't know if we can rely on politicians uh, because we, you know, this is 30, going on 40 years later, isn't it? And we are still in a situation in which the Southern states continue to have the highest rates of HIV. So I think we're going to, we're going to need a, a different form of advocacy uh, rather than relying on, on government. Yeah, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. We can, I think we can do both. So I think it's important to actually go for the systems and be hopeful and optimistic about um, changing those systems from within, changing those politics from within. And then exactly what you're saying, which is I think, you know, when people get exposed to certain traumas and oppression, which we have been uh, in the South um, as black people, as people of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities, uh, it tends to become internalized where uh, the oppressive force doesn't even need to actually keep their foot on our necks anymore, but we just basically will, you know, self-destruct um, on our own basically because we've internalized things. So I think your point about empowering ourselves uh, and getting ourselves to kind of face these systems, because you're absolutely right, nothing is going to change overnight and there will still be uh, members of our communities that will go into medical settings and be turned away because of the implicit bias or the uh, frank and open bias of a provider, of a staff member. And so we need to actually put it upon ourselves to encourage ourselves, educate ourselves and empower ourselves so that when we're in these spaces, we can rightly fight for and demand the services and the care that we deserve. It's such a good point. Yeah, 